Hi students, welcome to another note video. This is Miss Collins here. We are going to be talking um, or completing and working on these notes called the industrial age. So make sure you have your notes outline open and um, go ahead and follow along with the video. Remember you can pause any time to fill out your notes as we go and let's get started. Okay, so uh, when we talk about industrial age, maybe it makes you guys think of the industrial revolution, uh, which we talked about before um, in class. Remember that was a time when um, in um, Great Britain, they had found a way to use um, water to run machines in factories. And it in introduces all these different types of um, machines um, and all of them are really trying to help people get things done faster and more efficiently and um, it brings a lot of progress in a lot of different areas and we remember that it was secretly brought over to the United States and then we had our own industrial revolution here as well. Uh, well today we're talking um, about the second industrial revolution and how that's going to change things. So what I wanted to remind you too is uh, with that first industrial revolution, the biggest changes we saw were in transportation and communication, right? We saw the introduction of the railroad and um, we saw the introduction of the telegraph, which were both ways that really made getting from place to place and talking uh, to people a lot faster. And we discussed in class also how um, when we look in, like, even in today's world, like, what are the, re the inventions that have had, like, the biggest impacts on our lives? And um, a lot of us think of, like, our cell phones. Um, maybe we think of, like, our cars um, or airplanes, right? Those are things that are actually also related to transportation and communication. So it's something interesting to think about. Uh, so anyways, the second industrial revolution um, is also going to bring like a time of like rapid growth in manufacturing and new inventions and machines. Um, and by the mid 1890s into the early 1900s, the U.S. became the world's industrial leader. So we were um, just like creating the most machines that had the, you know, the biggest factories, the most efficient factories um, in the world. Um, and here is a picture <laughs> to show you what, you know, um, an industrial revolution is also going to bring, uh, which pollution is definitely a big aspect of it. But uh, it's a big change from focusing on farming to setting up factories and the idea of working in a factory, right? So um, in the indus second industrial revolution, the biggest changes are going to happen in regards to steel. So if you're like Miss Collins, what is steel? Uh, well, steel is like a um, a sort like a a like product. I don't know. I'm thinking the right word here. Um, that is made stronger by heat and other metals, and it's like stronger than iron. It's stronger than like any other metal at the time that existed. And um, this guy named Henry Bessemer had actually invented a way to manufacture steel quickly and cheaply by blasting hot air through melted iron um, to quickly remove the impurities. So something that used to take days now would take 10 to 20 minutes. So it made steel faster to produce and people wanted to produce it because it was such a strong material. So if this sounds anything like history, like if you think back to um, when we talked about Oh, where was I going with that? Um, oh, I could say like the cotton gin, right? That um, it made harvesting cotton faster and easier. And so then that's going to make cotton rise. So this example is with steel, though. The process of um, creating steel became quicker. And so then more people wanted to use steel. Uh, steel is going to make railroads cheaper. It makes trains nicer. Uh, it even leads to the invention of refrigerated shipping cars so um, that you could ship uh, cold items to like farther places. And you're going to see bigger cities uh, developing around railroads. And one example is Chicago. And we will talk a bit about 
oh, Chicago in our next set of notes and what it's going to be like there as a result of a city springing up by railroads, but a city also springing up where there's going to be lots of slaughterhouses. Joy. Okay, um, this graph is showing you the uh, rise in steel production. So right in the late 1800s, um, the yellow on the, this graph here is representing steel and you're seeing late 1800s, uh, very little is being produced and then you just see this boom, right? And that's because, um, as I said, um, a cheaper way, or sorry, an easier way was developed and eventually is gonna be introduced and so that's why you're gonna see this, this rise in steel. So um, some other inventions during the second industrial revolution, um, chemists had actually invented a way to convert like oil into fuel called kerosene. And um, kerosene is gonna be used in cooking and heating and lighting. Um, and this is where the demand for oil first starts. Uh, before this, oil wasn't used very much at all. Um, and then obviously, as we know, oil is going to lead to another important change, and that's related to cars. But we'll get there. Just give me a few slides. Um, and also discovered, right, that it's very easy to pump oil from the ground. Uh, people began, like, drilling all over and trying to find, like, deposits of oil under the earth, um, right, because they knew that they could use it for cooking and heating and lighting and things like that. So it became really important. Okay, cool. So we get to one of our first major inventions and an important person related to that invention, which is Thomas Edison. So Thomas Edison was interested in electricity and science. Um, over his lifetime, he held about 1,000 patents. Um, a patent is like that you have the right to like create this item like just you, right? So if I have a patent for a tree that grows dollar bills, that means only I can like produce this tree and nobody else because I have a patent on it. Um, and Edison was quite the inventor because he had over a thousand. Um, so by the end of 1879, Edison and his team had invented the electric light bulb. And so um, they built something called a power plant to supply electricity to dozens of New York City, New York City buildings. Um, originally, it's only going to start in cities because uh, they couldn't figure out how to send um, an electricity to further places. Eventually, that's going to change. Um, there's a man named George Westinghouse who's going to build a power system that can send electricity to further, like, miles and miles away. So what you're seeing now is a change of, like, this is, like, a huge change. Um, imagine, like, having to get up and walk around, and the only light you had was what you used with, like... Um, like a candle that you lit or something like that. Now there's something where you can just flip a switch and you automatically have light in your room. There's no like, it might burn out, it might catch on fire. I mean, it technically could, but um, the risks are a lot less than if you were like burning a candle. Um, and here's a quote from Edison. He said, I haven't failed. I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Good one, Edison. Um, another really important invention is going to come from our guy Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. Um, so right before, if we wanted to communicate with people, we would write down a message and then there was a telegraph, so then we could use Morse code and send a message that way. Um, but in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell is going to patent something called the telephone. Um, and he was a Scottish-born speech teacher, and he studied the science of sound and, like, how sound moves and how we can send sound. Um, and by the year 1900, more than 1 1.5 million phone lines are strung up across the United States. Um, and a German inventor is also going to create an engine powered by gasoline by the early 1900s. Um, that's going to be leading to thousands of cars being built in the U.S. So I know I'm kind of like going through these very quickly. <laughs> like we just saw the electric light bulb. We're just seeing the invention of something called the telephone, where now instead of tapping a message, you can speak into a device and it sends your words across the wire to a different person. And then we also see a machine that is taking oil and making an engine or gasoline, sorry, and making the engine run. So very big inventions. I know I'm kind of going through them fast, but um, that's because 
there's a lot of important ones. And if you're interested in any of these, I encourage you to like do your own research because um, it's really fascinating. So another very important invention and inventor um, is Henry Ford. So as I talked about before, a German inventor um, created an engine that was powered by gasoline. Um, and so cars started to be built in the United States. So Henry Ford does not create the first car ever. Let's be clear about that. Uh, what Henry Ford did is he noticed a lot of people couldn't afford um, to buy an automobile, to buy a car, because they were really expensive, because cars were like custom, like all of them were like different. Um, everyone was like unique. Is this making you think of something we've talked about before? Um, and so what he says is, why don't we create an assembly line to speed up the manufacturing process? So all the cars will be built exactly the same using the same interchangeable parts. Oh yeah, doesn't this sound like what we talked about before with Eli Whitney and he proposed using interchangeable parts to make guns so then we could mass produce guns? <laughs> yeah, so Henry Ford takes that same idea and puts it towards the car. So he introduces this car called the Model T and that's a picture of it on the slide. And um, because he's able to produce the car so quickly with, the, um, with using the... Um, assembly line, uh, he's able to make cars more affordable because, right, the place down the street can maybe make like one car a day where Henry Ford at his plant can make 10 a day. So he can um, charge uh, less for them because the process doesn't take as long for him. Um, and he has more product available. A quote from Henry Ford up here says, failure is simply the opportunity to begin again this time more intelligently. So um, I do have a video about this too. It's linked on the next slide. I'll go ahead and include a link to it in um, the description on this video. Um, so you can go ahead and check that out. I really encourage you to. It actually goes to one of Henry Ford's plants um, and shows you how the assembly line worked um, then and how it works now as well. It's really cool. Uh, another important invention in 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright build a lightweight airplane that used a small gas engine. What? That's crazy. Um, so essentially, they built an airplane um, and it actually worked and flew in the sky. Let me, here's a little of the video but, um, of the Henry Ford thing, but um, here's a picture of their little lightweight airplane. Oh, that'd be so cool to ride on. Like terrifying, but also really cool. So we just hit a bunch of big inventions. And like I said, I'm going through this quickly, but um, you will learn a lot more about this topic when you get um, to 11th grade U.S. history. This is kind of where you start your school year is talking about like the late 1800s, early 1900s. So we just like touch on it so you get a little intro about it, but you'll learn a lot more about this in 11th grade. So we saw a bunch of inventions. What we're going to jump to now is like big business. How is this, how is this change? How is this industrial revolution going to affect businesses? Um, it's going to affect them a lot. So um, many people who want to like start businesses, we call them entrepreneurs, um, are going to start creating something called corporations. And a corporation is just like a business that wants to sell part of the ownership in forms of things called stocks. Um, and these are often most respected, like most of the people that lead these companies are respected members of society. They're praised for their hard work, their talent, and their success. Um, and so people, like average people, can buy a part of a company by buying stock in that company. So what it means is it doesn't mean like when you buy, so you, for example, nowadays you can buy a portion of the company Apple, okay, right, who makes our phones, computers, all sorts of stuff, you guys know. Um, so what you could do is nowadays you could buy a share of Apple, and what that means is you own part of the Apple company, and you're like, wait, how could I own part of the Apple company? Well, you can, you just have to buy part of a stock of that company. Um, owning a stock doesn't mean that you get to like run the day-to-day -day of the company and be like, I fire you or I hire you. Um, it just means that you get a share of the profits or you could lose money. But let's say Apple does really well and the company becomes more and more valuable. Your stock in that company becomes worth more and more money and you could sell it 
any time you'd like. There's some rules about it, but um, so let's say you buy a stock in Apple and it's $5 for one stock. So like one part of the company. And then in like two years, the company released a new product and it's like doing really well. And maybe now a stock in Apple costs $300. So you just made a big profit by only putting in $5. Now it's worth $300. You could sell it and you have made money by doing pretty much nothing except that you put down $5 a couple years ago. Now, same thing could happen the opposite way where Apple could like do really poorly and then it's years going by and now the stock to buy a stock share of Apple, it's like 25 cents and then you've now lost money. Um, so you could just hold on to your stock. You could sell it. It's up to you. But um, this is kind of uh, trying to explain to you a little bit about buying shares in companies, what it means to buy a shares in companies, the risk associated with that. You could be profitable, you could lose money. Um, you also don't have to do any of this. You don't have to buy shares of company. Um, and again, this is actually something you'll learn a lot about in your senior year of high school. You'll take a class called economics and you'll learn all about like corporations and what it means to buy into a corporation if you're interested in that. Okay back to what I was talking about here. Uh, da, da, da. So by the year 1900, 100 million shares were being traded on the New York Stock Exchange every year. So that means there's tons of companies in the United States that are like, hey, we are public companies, you can buy a share of our company. And by the way, this is only for like public companies. If your company is private, um, you do not have to like have people buy shares of your company okay again there's so much more to this I'm just sort of giving you a basic intro but if you're interested in what it means more please ask me questions um, email me or of course you can research as well but we're going to keep on going <laughs> okay so um, th this next area we're getting to is we're going to talk a lot about people who made a lot of money during this time. Remember, we're talking about the Gilded Age. This is like the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I um, remember we talked about like, um, when we talked about the intro of this unit, uh, you're seeing some of the wealthiest Americans in history that made their money during the second industrial revolution by having different inventions, by buying different companies, by starting different companies. But you're also going to see some of the poorest people in society and what they're suffering through. So this week, or these notes, we're really talking about some of the wealthiest people and how they made their money. Um, in our next set of notes, we're going to talk about the people who are struggling and like what it's like for them on the other side. So uh, one of our first billionaires is Andrew Carnegie. Uh, hopefully you've probably heard of him. Uh, he was born in Scotland and came to the U.S. as a poor immigrant. As a teen, he took a job with a railroad company and he basically like, worked his way up in the company um, and was able to sort of like buy the company. Um, something that he did is he bought out his competitors when the steel prices were really low. Um, and so what we call this is vertical integration, um, which just means that you own businesses involved in each step of the manufacturing process. Um, he would buy the mines, the coal fields, the railroads. He would buy every aspect of the railroad business. Um, when he sold his business, um, Carnegie Steel, he sold it to J.P. Morgan in 1901, and his company was worth $480 million. In today's money, that would be about $372 billion. Billions. Okay, and this is a guy who came here with nothing, started in a company, worked his way up, bought the company, made it super successful by like buying up competitors, buying up like other steel companies, and then sold it and became a billionaire. <laughs> Um, but what's really cool is after he sold his business, um, he dedicated his life to, um, philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy is like, um, working with like charity and like trying to help people and give back to society. Um, so he donated about 90% of his total fortune to charities. 
Um, so that's awesome. Um, he really cared about libraries, world peace, science, and education. Um, I do want to point out, too, I'm kind of just highlighting some great things about Andrew Carnegie. Um, there are lots of negative things as well in regards to how he treated his workers in his factories. Um, so that's a whole other story for another day. But um, Car Carnegie said, no man will make a great leader who wants to do it all himself or to get all the credit for doing it. That's such a great quote, right? Be a good leader means you give other people responsibilities too and um, you get help. You don't just do it yourself. Um, so this is called Carnegie Hall. It's in New York City. It's named after Andrew Carnegie um, and it's a, um, what's the word? A or hmm, you can play music there. It's a music hall. There you go. <laughs> My cousin actually um, played cello there, but. Um, continuing on, if you guys uh, think back to when we did a little intro on this unit, um, if you remember and I asked you if anybody knew who the richest American of all time was, um, that's this guy, John D. Rockefeller. It's not Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon. It's not Steve Jobs with Apple. It's a guy from the Gilded Age, John D. Rockefeller. So Rockefeller, um, he started working in the oil companies um, at the age of 21, so like pretty young, and um, he started this company called Standard Oil, and it became the largest oil refiner anywhere. <laughs> um, and he also used vertical integration like Andrew Carnegie. Um, and so again, what that means is he like, um, uh, right, we talked about like buying up your competitors, he also bought up like every process of like getting the oil. So he would buy up the fields where the oil came from in the ground. He bought the, the companies that would transport the oil to the refinery. Um, he bought then the like stations that would sell like the oil to people or things like that. It's like buying every step of the process. Um, and, um, there's controversy with that, of course. Uh, Car uh, Rockefeller said from the beginning, I was trained to work, to save and to give. Um, this is Rockefeller Center. It's, um, a place in New York City and it's composed of a bunch of buildings, like 10 or 12 buildings. Um, and there's of course this ice rink with the tree that they put up every year, but it's named after John D. Rockefeller. And there's all these different businesses and things that some of them belong to the Rockefeller family and some of them um, don't. But, uh, if you ever go to New York, you have to check out Rockefeller Center. Um, so we're not done talking about Rockefeller. We'll still talk about him a little bit more, but um, something that Rockefeller did and what many other people did too during this time is they formed something called a trust. And a trust is like an illegal, a legal agreement, arrangement, um, grouping together a number of companies under one single board of directors. And they found that they could earn more money by getting rid of competition and controlling production. Um, so Rockefeller did this by just, again, buying up competitors so that he didn't have any competitors in the oil industry. And so when he, um, it's estimated that he was worth about $400 billion in today's money. Um, but obviously if you're like Miss Collins, it sounds really sketchy or maybe you're like, I don't understand what this means. I think I've talked a little bit about a four before in class about competition and what that means if you buy out your competitors and how that's bad for like it's bad for us, the people who are buying the product. It's great for the companies because they make lots of money. So, for example, a really quick example. Let's say I am the only person who knows how to make chips, okay? The kind you eat. Yum. I'm the only one who knows it, how to do it. And everybody loves chips. And I sell my chips for $20 a bag. Yes, they're very expensive chips. Um, but then one day somebody comes along and they're like, hey, Miss, hey, I know how to make chips too. And they're like, I'm going to start my own chip company. And they're selling their bags of chips for $15 a bag. And I'm like, wait, what? Now I have competition. So now me and this other company might be trying to continue to lower our prices because we want the customers to come and buy from us. Okay. That's competition. It makes prices lower because we're competing against each other to get your business. Let's say though, go back to if I had no competitors, I could charge whatever price I want. 
right? So that's why like when we're talking about companies like buying up competitors, that can be really bad because it means that those companies have complete control over price and they could charge really high prices. So um, eventually, I don't think I skipped anything, did I? Oh, no, I think I'll get to it in a little bit. But um, eventually there's going to be um, laws put in place, we'll get to some in a second, um, that are going to say it's like illegal to do things like this, to buy up like competitors. Um, and actually, John D. Rockefeller, Rockefeller um, he had to break up his company into smaller companies um, and about 34 smaller companies. So um, companies like Chevron or Mobile, you may have heard of these gas stations or, you know, oil companies. These were all originally part of Andrew or of, sorry, of John D. Rockefeller's um, oil companies, his U.S. Standard Oil. But they had to be broken up after different laws were um, passed. Um, so sorry to end with Rockefeller. I should have ended before I got to Vanderbilt here. But um, when he uh, retired, he also spent a lot of money in philanthropy, like in donating and giving back. Um, he really cared about medicine, education, and science. Um, and he helped eradicate two different diseases. Uh, one was hookworm and one was yellow fever in the United States because of the money he donated to science. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump to Cornelius Vanderbilt really quick. Um, he also, like Carnegie, grew up very poor, very uneducated, um, but he worked really hard. And uh, what he did is he made his money through shipping, like um, moving products from place to place. And it's estimated that he was worth roughly $215 billion dollars. Um, and he also in later life became a philanthropist and donated millions of dollars to charities, um, especially he really cared about donating to churches and to universities and things like that. <clears throat> and he said, you have undertaken to cheat me. I won't sue you for the law is too slow. I'll ruin you. Oh, rough. Um, here is the Biltmore Estate um, built by Vanderbilt. Um, and this was one of his one of his homes. It's pretty nice. It's still there. Um, so we can't end um, our talking about these guys. We'll talk about what their our nickname for these guys are. But um, our last one we'll talk about is J.P. Morgan. <clears throat> so um, J.P. Morgan, you may have heard of him. J.P. Morgan Chase, the company, the bank. Uh, J.P. Morgan was a financier and a banker. So a financier is someone who like takes money and invests it into other companies and like buys other companies. Um, and he helped finance U.S. Steel. He helped finance General Electric, the company AT&T, and um, tons and tons of railroads. Um, so he just made really smart investments with the money that he had. Um, and he um, even one time bailed out the U.S. government. Um, in 1907, there was a panic, right? There was about to be a depression. And he organized a group of other investors and they were able to bail out the American government. That was pretty cool. So they saved, they saved it from a big depression happening but it would happen later. Um, ironically, um, he was estimated to only be worth about um, $118 million. Um, and a lot of that was actually through his art collection. And so John D. Rockefeller said, like, wow, to think the man wasn't even that rich. No, but he had his hand in, like, sort of every little business. And uh, he made really smart investments. And he bailed out the government, which is pretty cool. So he said, a man always has two reasons for doing anything. A good reason and the real reason. Dun, dun, dun. So um, many of these men are nicknamed robber barons. Um, and we call them robber barons because it means like someone who pays like a low wage, someone who squashes competition, creates monopolies, and exploits the government. So Right. I talked about a lot of good things that these men did as far as like companies they started, money they made, charities they gave to. But it wasn't always great for their workers. Their workers weren't always treated the best. Um, and they did things, like I said, like bought up competitors, created monopolies, tried to create trusts. 
Um, and so it wasn't always good for the consumer. So robber barons is where this nickname comes from. And I actually have a little video about it that I will again link for you below. Um, so you can check that out. And it talks about some of these guys that we just learned about. Okay. Sorry, these notes are long, but there's just a lot of important things to cover here. Um, so by the late 1800s, people started to become uncomfortable with like all these factories popping up. It's leading to increase in child labor. Um, people are being paid very low wages. Working conditions in factories are really poor. Some people were like, you know, it's all social Darwinism. Um, it's all um, like natural selection. Some human beings are going to be successful in businesses and some are just going to struggle in life. And that's the way things are. Other people believed like that the rich had a duty to like help out the poor in society. Um, and as we know, some of these um, robber barons gave um, millions of dollars to charities. But not everybody was like that. Some people were just out to like make a buck and they didn't care like who got squashed in the process of it. <clears throat> So I mentioned before that I would um, I, that I would get to this that there was con there was concern that like as these companies were buying up competitors it would create something called a monopoly. So like the game, um, a monopoly, right? What are you trying to do in the game monopoly, right? To win, you win if you like buy up the most places, right? Um, and then people land on your spots and then like you take all their money. So you win by having like either the most strategic places or like buying up the most amount of places on the board. And right. A monopoly is where <clears throat> you have total ownership. You buy out your competitors. You have no competition. Like in my chip example, I have no competition. I'm the only one who knows how to make chips or I buy out any of the other companies that know how to make chips. Um, and people said that they wanted, they, they didn't like this. They want the government to get involved. They want the government to stop monopolies from happening because it's not going to be helpful to people. So in July 1890, Congress passed something called the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was a law that made it illegal to create monopolies or trusts um, and law. But the thing is, like, laws were really difficult to enforce because there wasn't a clear definition of what a trust was. Um, and so this is, can sometimes be an issue still today. Uh, there was actually just recently um, talk about a merger between two phone companies, Sprint and T-Mobile. And one of the issues that comes up is this issue of monopoly of like, are we by letting these two companies join together? Are we like creating less competition? So then these two companies together could just make, you know, your phone bill prices like really high or is it okay that they do this and merge together? Um, so that's actually something in the news right now. If you want to Google that, um, I just saw that actually this week. So check that out. <clears throat> so let's talk about the workers, the people that are working in these factories that are working for these robber barons. Um, these people working in these factories, um, most of them are unskilled workers. They run machines. Um, they are paid very low money. They can be re replaced easily. Um, and there are many people looking for jobs, so they have a lot of competition. Uh, factories focused on like spe specialization, uh, where one worker would do the same step over and over again. Um, and it made workers really tired and bored, and sometimes they'd likely to get injured. Like, your job is just to screw this one bolt on the car every day, and as each car comes by, you screw that bolt, it goes on to the next person, and you'd get bored and more likely to get hurt. So workers started forming things called unions uh, to get better wages and working conditions. So a union is just a group of people that like work for the same company that want to unite together and work together to try and advocate for change in their company. <clears throat> so the Knights of Labor is the first ever National Labor Union founded in the 1870s. What did they want? They wanted an eight hour work day. They wanted to end child labor and they thought that the government should regulate trust, like the formation of like monopolies, right? <clears throat> um, so let me explain a little bit about like a union and how that works. So I'll give the example with, um, let's say, uh, okay, I'll give the example of like our school. 
So let's say the teachers were like, oh, we really want to have um, lunch is only 30 minutes. We want lunch to be an hour. Um, so like I go to Mr. Torres and I'm like, Mr. Torres, I want lunch to be an hour. And he's like, that's cool. No. Okay. And then I walk away. And I'm like, that sucked. <laughs> what I could do is form a union, right? Power in numbers. And I could be like, okay, all the other teachers, let's get together. We're all going to go to Mr. Torres and say, we want a one hour lunch because he's more likely to listen if all of us go in there. And if he doesn't listen to us, what we could do is we could hold something called a strike. And so we're like, Mr. Torres, we want a one hour lunch. And he's like, no. Then we'll be like, cool, Mr. Torres, we're not going to come here to work until we get what we want. So it hurts his company and we can try and fight for better changes. And it's all about unity in numbers. Um, <clears throat> So women are going to um, definitely play a role in unions. Um, we, if you did your project, um, your, remember your magazine cover project? Um, some of you guys did yours on Sarah Bagley, and she was um, a female union leader, actually. But uh, one famous woman was Mary um, Harris Jones. She was an Irish immigrant, um, and she helped organize strikes. Um, she educated workers and she really wanted better working conditions for minors. So, um, as a result, strikes started to occur all over the country. Um, many of them, in fact, most of these strikes are going to be violent, um, where those protesting would be killed. Um, so remember how I gave my example of like people striking and saying like, we're not going to work till we get what we want. Sometimes when that would happen, the company would like call the police and the police would show up and be like, if you don't go to work, we're going to like shoot you. Um, and those things actually like happened. Um, or sometimes they would attack the protesters. Um, in one example here, the Haymarket riot, um, someone threw a bomb and it killed eight police officers. And so then the police just like opened fire into the crowd and killed a bunch of people in the crowd. That's just one example. Uh, another one is the Homestead Strike, uh, and this one took place at one of Andrew Carnegie's factories, actually. Um, and he, like, some of the workers found out that he was going to buy some new machines and he was going to fire a bunch of people in the factory. So they went on strike, and the strike went on for four months. And during those four months, 16 of the workers were killed because the state militia was called in and they killed a bunch of the people going on strike. Uh, another major strike is the Pullman strike, um, and this one was related to the railroads um, and, and jobs being cut there as well. Um, they were striking because a bunch of them had been laid off, um, and those who were still there were getting paid, like, even less money. And um, the president was actually sent troops in to stop this specific strike. Woo, sorry specific strike y'all and on this last one um so there's actually a lot of strikes to talk about they're really interesting and there's a lot of details to them and you're going to be like wait how is that allowed to happen like how come the police were just allowed to show up and be like you're not going to work cool we're going to shoot you like how did that happen it's interesting why that was allowed to happen um but it did so um usually like we do a project with this um but obviously, that's not going to happen since we're doing our distance learning here. So I'm going to come up with something different where I will give you the opportunity, though, to like read about one of these strikes. Um, and um, we'll go forward with that. But hopefully from these notes, what you got in the second industrial revolution is we see another rise in factories um, and a big change in like new inventions and then people who are going to become really rich off of this industrial revolution and are going to come up with new ways to like make money and like strike it rich. Um, and then you're going to see like labor unions emerging and workers trying to fight for better rights. So as these, uh, some people are like gaining like tons of money, what about the common person? They're kind of being left behind and treated poorly. Um, and so how are they trying to fight back? So that's what we did in these notes. Thanks for listening and have a lovely day.